with winter in some kind of way. Um, and what's really fascinating to me at the moment is that after working with these amazing people since noon this afternoon, I just found out what some of them actually do in their real lives, which I think is really fascinating, <laughs> having just found that out. Because when you get together with a group of people and you're working creatively, you're working with people's spirits and their creative spark and their performative energy um, and the way that they move and their sense of humor, which is incredible. Um, and it doesn't matter what your ages are. You could all be any age or we could all be 16 or we could all be 23 or whatever we are. And just now I found out just what a few of them actually do, which is really kind of, I, I'm sort of floored. Um, because who you think someone is before they give you an introduction could be completely different <laughs> from who they really are. Um, I've had just the joy this afternoon of watching and listening to each of them be very creative and imaginative and use language and work with words and, um, and tell stories that are sincere and in some of them very resonant and not funny and then some of them hilarious and some of them are both combined. Um, but because my experience of them is in the capacity of their creativity and the way that they use words and the way that they perform and tell stories, I'm really amazed that they're not all professional storytellers right now because, because, um, because by now I feel that they are professional storytellers, but they actually come from all professions. I'm going to read their introductions. Um, and I'm going to read them in just in in the order in which I have them in my hand actually now. So um, Gail Neary Herman is here helping to raise money for the Forbes Library Book Fund. She just wrote a book with her husband Steve about Steve's mother's life called Tales of Mischievous Martha: New York City Wanderings, Foster Care, and Orphanage Life. Please welcome with me to the stage, Gail. My story is about my mother-in-law. <laughs> and it's really amazing when you don't know a person totally. You know, and then you read what they did with their lives. So when I first met my mother-in-law, you know, she seemed very organized and very sensible and very um, formidable in a way. But when we read her memoir, I found it after she died. Um, and it was on the side of her bed in a little yellow spiral bound notebook. And one of the stories in there really let me into her true nature because when she was little, she lived in an orphanage. It was sort of like a boarding school for her because her mother was back home in New York. Because her father had died, there wasn't anyone to really watch the kids, so they had to go to the orphanage. And she went to school there. And it was uh, the March period of winter which isn't really winter, it's more like the sun out, and it's the first time people want to go out. And she and her friend Hilda wanted to go and take a walk down to this old train platform that they knew was on the edge of a meadow, but it was in the woods a little bit, and there was a train track that went by there. And so Martha and Hilda were sitting there, just letting their legs dangle. And Hilda said to Martha, you know, Miss Thompson, our teacher, says that we shouldn't go anywhere near that train track and that creek on the other side. Well, Martha heard the word shouldn't. She looked at her friend Hilda and she said, oh yeah, you dare me? And before Hilda could say no, Martha had jumped down off, to, off that platform and ran and jumped over the train track 
and then try to leap over that creek. But when she did, she found herself up to her knees in mud because that creek was a lot bigger than that little girl was. And then, as she realized she was beginning to sink in the mud, she got really, really scared. And so she started to turn around and, and she called to Hilda. She said, oh, Hilda, I'm sinking. By that time, she was up to her waist, I mean, to her thighs. And she said, as she tried to get through this mud, come and get me. So Hilda ran down the side of the bank and held out her hands like this to Martha. And she said, OK, Martha. By this time, Martha was up to, really up to her waist. She said, OK, Martha, I'm going to pull you. And she started to pull. And she, and she pulled Martha right out of that mud and onto the edge of the bank. And then she looked at Martha and she said, oh, look at you. Martha looked down at herself and, oh, I made it. Oh my gosh, she, everything had just been sucked off of her. You know, her shoes, her little bloomers, and her skirt, and everything. She said, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? I, I, I can't go back like this. Hilda just looked at Martha and said, I don't know, it beats me. And she started to leave. <laughs> Martha said, no, you come back. You've got to help me lend me your bloomers. Bloomers? I'm not lending you my bloomers, said Hilda. And Martha said, but why not? Hilda said, because you stink. <laughs> Martha said, well, what is that smell? Hilda just looked at her and said, that's what I was trying to tell you, Martha. That's not mud. That's sewage. Oh, gosh. Please lend me your bloomers. And Hilda just said, no, I'm not lending you my bloomers. So Martha had to cross her heart and hope to die that she would boil those bloomers three times before she gave them back to Hilda. Well, finally, Hilda took them off, gave them to Martha, and Martha went home, she said, a much wiser little girl. She learned three things. Never to dare anyone. Never to take any dares. But most of all, never to dare herself. And she says she kept that promise. And I think she did. Till the day she died. Thank you. Um, Renee Anderson is about to enter a significant decade, and she is both dragging her feet and jumping forward. Renee is a grandmother, a mother, <coughs> and a friend. She lives in Northampton. Please welcome with me to the stage Renee Anderson. Hi, my name is Renee Anderson. Hi. So I want to start with, um, is anyone here from Pakistan? <laughs> I'm just going to say something not so nice about Pakistan at some point of telling of this tale, and I don't want to offend anyone. So, um, some of you have enough gray hair to appreciate this, but this story takes place in 1970. So let me first begin with, I have a 42-year-old daughter, beautiful daughter, and she has three children, a 21-year-old, a 5-year-old, and a 2-year-old, and her hands are full. And it's my only child, and she's given me three grandchildren, and what a great return on investment. <laughs> so, 1970, I had met a man who grew up seven miles from where I grew up on the North Shore of Boston. I met him in Australia, and we ended up, lots of ways, we ended up in India. I wanted to, I was heading for India to go see my guru, and 
We ended up in India. Before getting to India, we were in Singapore. Now, Singapore is this big metropolis, and we ended up at an ashram, the Guru's ashram in Singapore. And the caretaker there, a very old man, took a liking to me. And he let us sleep together, and we were not married at that point, in the Guru's bedroom, because I think he thought we were married. Now, on this one night, was this huge silver moon. There's only a moon in the tropics can appear, just silver white. And something happened that night. And I went outside and I stood at the back door and there were these huge flowers, they were white, and they were as big as dinner platters. And the moon was shining through them and I knew something happened. I didn't know what. We ended up moving on to India. We went to the ashram and I got very, very ill. And of course, I'm in India, so I thought that's what's going on. And I couldn't hold food down and I was so sick. Well, it turned out I was pregnant. I was very <laughs> pregnant. I was so ill. So we decided, we had decided eventually we would go back to the States. And so we got married in what's now Mumbai. We got married in Bombay. Bombay in this really, you know, woke up the morning we were going to get married and we grabbed two people out of this very funky hotel and off we went to the minister of whatever he was in the state that Bombay was in and we went to sit down in his office and said, no, 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 just sign these papers and there were 27 sheets of paper. We're signing and we're signing and we're signing and it says, Leonard Anderson, poet. Irene Colonus, spinster. So that's what's on our, our papers. <laughs> it's a poet and a spinster. <laughs> well, it was, um, by this time, it was the end of December, beginning of January, and we were going overland. And in those days, there were these hippie buses that went from India over to Turkey. And to do that, you went through the Khyber Pass. Well, it comes to pass. In the winter, the pass is closed because of snow. So there was a period of a few days where the pass was opened, and the bus driver of the hippie bus said, we'll, we're leaving, we're going. So we, a bunch of us got on the bus, and we get up, and we're going up the mountain and up the mountain, and it's more and more snow, more and more snow, more and more snow. Off on my left-hand side is a sheer drop. There are trucks coming this way, we're going this way, sheer drop on this side. So what happened was, it was snowing and snowing and thicker and thicker until we could not see in front of us. I knew there was a drop on this side and that there was a mountain on this side and that there's a likelihood that a truck or another bus would be coming towards us, but we couldn't see. Meanwhile, when I tell you I was sick, I was sick. I carried plastic bags with me. No one would sit near us because I had these plastic bags. And um, but what happened was the bus came to a halt. And they told us all to get off the bus and to push it. <laughs> so we got off the bus. I got off the bus. We all got off the bus. And they start pushing the bus and pushing the bus and pushing the bus. You can't see what's ahead of you. And, and then I got weaker and weaker. And Len and I, my new husband, were left behind. Eventually we can't see. We don't know where we are. Can't see the bus. Can't see where the cliff is. Can't see where the mountain is. We just stand in a blizzard. And so eventually they realized that we were gone. And what they did is somebody held onto the bus like this, and then they held a string of hands like this, all the time calling our names. Rini, Lynn, Rini, Lynn, Rini, Lynn. We could hear it. So now the trick was, be careful walking that we don't go off the cliff. Be careful walking that we don't fall in the ditch before the mountain. So Lynn held out his hand like this, to see if he could feel along the mountain. We tried to follow the voices. We finally got back to the bus. 
and we all just sat in the bus. We didn't know if there were any trucks coming towards us. We didn't know what was going on. In the morning, the snow had settled, sunlight, six feet in front of us was a huge truck. It stopped, it had just stopped like we had because it could not see ahead. So then the problem was, how were we going to pass each other? Eventually that happened, we passed one another. We kept climbing up and climbing up and then came down, down, down the Khyber Pass into Pakistan. When we got to Pakistan, we just were so relieved. So now we went from blizzard conditions to really hot. We were going through a small village and the bus broke down. Well, we were surrounded by about 200 villagers who started to rock the boat. It was 1970, the United States was not very popular anywhere we traveled. They were rocking, rocking, rocking. I said the boat. They were rocking the bus and rocking the bus, and the bus is just feels like it's going to tilt over, and then they're rocking the bus. Finally, some police came, and they pushed the, cop, the bus into a courtyard, and we stayed in this courtyard for about five, six, seven days until enough uh, parts for the bus came along. But there was no food, there was water, and we couldn't leave the courtyard because the villagers were so angry with us. I don't know why. Of course, we were Americans primarily. But um, so we stayed in this courtyard. Now, I was about four months pregnant. So then when we left Turkey, we went through all these interesting places and the bus kept break, breaking down. We broke down in Kabul, in Afghanistan. That was a wonderful place to break down. What a wonderful, rough territory that is. You know, so, many, so much about people, their face and their personality is shaped, it seems, by the environment. So Afghanistan is a very, very rugged place, very rugged. People have very rugged, chiseled kind of features. I loved Afghanistan, loved Kabul. Then we broke down in Tehran, and uh, we spent a while there. And that was a really hard place because, again, how much we were hated, how much Americans were hated. I spent a lot of time saying I was Canadian, except when you get to a border, you know. Um, Tehran was very sophisticated city. It was so beautiful. And I was told, I don't know, that the food was exquisite, mm -hmm. just exquisite. I wouldn't know. Um, we headed on across western, eastern, eastern Turkey. We drove on and we got to Istanbul. When we got to Istanbul, Len and I had no money bus let us off. I mean, when I say no money, we had no money, none whatsoever. So we went into a hotel, we checked in and stayed at that hotel until some hippies were kind enough to loan us some money and we said, when we get to the States, we'll mail it back to you. We headed on to Athens where we eventually flew home. So a quick story about Athens. I had lived in Athens for a little over a year. I had been a tutor there. So I said to Len, let's go up to see where I used to live. I lived in this beautiful place called Anafiotica, which was right underneath the Acropolis. It doesn't exist anymore. But in the morning, I would wake up and I would go out. I had an outhouse, had a little outhouse. I had my own little tiny courtyard, little outhouse right there in my house. And I would go out and look up, and there was the Acropolis. Right over my head, like right there, was the Acropolis. So I said, let's go look at where I used to live. So we stopped at a little piazza to get some Katnes Cafe, very Greek, um, to get some Nescafe. And there were two men sitting at a table, and I look over. And now I'm showing, I'm pregnant. And I'm wearing a dress I had made in Afghanistan. I still have that dress. I'm wearing this dress. I'm out to here. And I walk over to the table, and one of the men looks up and goes, Oh, Famu Irini. And the other one goes, Raini. Mm -hmm. Well, 
There was the fellow I lived with when I lived in Athens, <laughs> and there was the fellow I lived with when I lived in Australia. <laughs> they were housemates. <laughs> so the Greek fellow, he just glommed on to uh, Westerners. He just really liked traveling with Westerners. So that's how he got to know the other fellow. So Len Anderson came over and said, Rini, and I go, who's he, and what's that? And um, so there they were, the three men that, that were so important to me over the years when I was a hippie. Mm -hmm. The Greek, the Australian, and the American. <laughs> you know, there's something about storytelling I want to say something about why I wanted to do this, besides that we need more poetry books um, in the library. Um, that there is a phenomenon called, there's poetry slamming and story slamming. Now the big thing is story slamming. And the big overarching um, organization for that, and I don't want to knock it because the woman who started it, Catherine Porter, is a phenomenal woman and I've known her my entire career, which is really, really long. And um, her name is Catherine and she's, her concept was the moth. And the moth started in New York City and now it's all over the world. Um, and so I saw it on the Academy of Music, I saw, you know, Story Slam, Northampton Story Slam. And the whole premise of a slam is that it's a competition. And that people are competing with each other, telling five minute stories. And that somebody's going to be better than another person. And then somebody's going to be the best. And you know, it isn't like I'm one of those people who wanted to give children awards for everything, right? I mean, we went through that long phase of everybody's a winner thing. But I think that our culture has gone like completely in the other direction, where we've turned creativity into a competition. And um, I like everyone except for people like that. No, um, <laughs> I, I'm very, very strongly wanting to generate a forum so that people like the individuals who came to the workshop today can get up and tell these stories without competing, because they're all, each individual in this workshop is so singular in what she or he has to tell, and that it ought not be a competition. How crazy is that, right? Because it's as if each story, it's like saying, is a diamond more precious than an emerald or a ruby? And there is no way to discern that. And the other aspect is, this. while this is being taped, um, we don't have a culture anymore where we get together and tell each other stories. I mean, this human encounter is dramatic and human and energizing in a way like none other. So this is really, I mean, amazing to me that it's actually happening and that the stories being told are, um, I want you to know these are not memorized scripts. This was not a workshop in writing stories and memorizing them. This was a workshop in improvisational spontaneity and storytelling, which, which predated writing <laughs> in, in the world. And that evidently, everybody in the workshop has not been doing this professionally. But so far, that would be impossible to gauge. So our next storyteller is Sally Boutte. Um, and Sally Boutte is going to be telling a story about why her grandma would never lose. 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 Oh, I get it. So I'm a little slow on the uptake here when it's not my story. Okay, Sally Boutte had a grandmother who beat her at cards. And this is a story about why her grandmother would never lose at anything. Sally Boutte, much to my astonishment, <laughs> at the end of this workshop told me when I asked her, 
because I thought maybe she does this professionally, um, or was in theater or something. Um, but she's an acupuncturist, <laughs> which I didn't know it's not funny that you're an acupuncturist. It's just that if you saw her in the workshop, I mean, she's, I thought she was in theater. You know, I thought she was doing this professionally. I know you're nodding, right? Did, didn't you have that impression? Okay, well, she sticks needles in people, all right? <laughs> she's, she's an acupuncturist, um, and no question must be very healing. Um, at that. <laughs> so please welcome with me to the stage, Sally Boutet. I'm going to bring my needles today. <laughs> okay, I, I wanted to tell a story. I'm very nervous, as you can see. <laughs> About my grandmother. When I was a little girl, I, I, my feelings were pretty sensitive, the way most kids are. And my grandmother would come every Friday night, we'd have Sabbath. And she was tall and slim and very skinny of leg. And she wore those glasses without any rims. And her hair was braided every which way on top of her head. Um, and had bright blue henna in it, which she didn't quite realize. But she was a very formidable woman. Uh, she talked with a thick Yiddish accent. What is this? You know, like that, you know. We're going to have chicken? I want the Pope's tail. She always got that. Uh, so, she was, so my grandmother grew up in a place where there were dirt floors, thatched roofs, outhouses. Outhouses would be fancy, you know, they um, melted snow. Um, for water in the winter, they ate kartoffels, which were potatoes, and fish, barrels of fish, and sugar beets. That, it, she lived a very simple life. One thing that was very impressive about her was the way she could spit. My brother and I would practice, you know, my grandmother could go, <laughs> and I mean, she could put a longer further than any guy you ever saw. You know? So, but we tried and we dribbled down our chin. So we would play cards, and uh, as we played cards, I would always say, well, I hope I win, I hope I win, I hope I win. My brother was older, so he was going to win me. But Grandma, she could be nice, right? She should be nice. She was a grandma. I'd seen pictures of them in books. They give you cookies. <laughs> <laughs> so we would play hand after hand after hand, and I would lose and lose and lose. You know, my brother would slam down. You know, ah, ah, mix up the cards, your cards are crying because my cards are beating your cards up <laughs> and you know, that meant I was a loser. So I went in the kitchen one day and I stood there while my father was reading the paper and I had to be quiet because, you know, he was very important, he was my father and I was only to be noticed when he wanted me to notice me. But I stood there long enough and finally he turned around and he said, what's your problem? I said, Grandma's mean, she won't let me win. Lost and lost and lost. And he said, don't you know? And I said, what? He said, don't you know why she won't lose? And I said, no, why won't she lose to me? I'd like her to lose to me a few times so I could be a winner. And he said, when your grandmother was a little girl, she was one of many children. But that spring in Russia, was overrun with rats. And with the rats came the Schwarze Cholera, which was the Black Plague, Schwarze Black Cholera Plague. He said, everyone in her family died except for her, and she was three. All her brothers and sisters had died. Her mother had died, and it was her father, and she was left. And she began to shukle, and shukle is shake. And she shookled, and she shookled, and she shookled. And then winter came. And when winter came, she was so small, she was a little stick. And in Vladivostok, the winters are very cold. And your great-grandfather said, oh my god, I'm going to lose not only my wife, my seven children, all my sons, I'm going to lose little Sarah, too. 
and he didn't know what to do. He was giving her the kartoffels, he was giving her the fish she wouldn't eat. So it was too cold really to go out, but he felt he had to go out because she was going to die, he knew it. So he bundled her up and he put her in the drushka, which was a kind of a sleigh drawn by horses. And he brought her out to where there was this big fire. And she could smell a terrible smell. It was sweet and strange. And when they got closer, she could see, and he showed her, that it was logs placed one way and bodies faced the other. And then logs and bodies. And they were burning them because if they waited till the spring, they would bring back the plague. And he brought her so close she was sure that he would put her right in the fire with it. And she shuckled more and she grabbed onto her father's beard. And he brought her to the rabbi. And he said, Rabbi, what do I do? My daughter won't stop shuckling. The rabbi had a little bag around his neck. And he took it off, it was on a string, and he bent over and he picked up some ashes and he opened the little leather bag and he put them in and tightened it. And he put it around your grandmother's neck and he said, in this bag is the ashes of your mother and she's in heaven and if you shuckle, she won't rest in peace. So you must stop shuckling. And she held, and she tried to stop shaking, and she did. And my grandfather brought her back in the drushka. Later, they escaped pogroms, where children were killed in front of them. She lived in the detention camps in Germany. She moved to America. She had her four sons, her husband. She played cards, she was a card shop, she drank whiskey, she stood on tables and danced the Kazatsky and got kicked out of restaurants. She spit further than any man. And my father said, and so you think she would lose cards to a little girl? <laughs> and is learning to dream big. Oh, Jan, <laughs> and Jan Sadler is a writer, a poet, and an editor who creates books for writers. She's also a visual artist who has exhibited her works in the Western Massachusetts area. Jan has founded the creative writing program at the Springfield Museums. A Winter's Tale, or two. I grew up in Rhode Island, and just in case you're not sure, it is not an island off of New York. <laughs> I have no tale to tell. I have only impressions in winter over almost 70 years. As a little girl, I loved the winter and playing snow angels, laying on my back with my best friend, spreading our wings and leaving an imprint of an angel. It was heaven. I was born on New Year's Eve <clears throat> on a dark and starry night. I don't know if there was snow. It was the dead of winter. Snow angels is different than building an eagle. My first child was born in January on a beautiful, sunny, freezing day in St. Louis. 
You build an igloo after Dad has shoveled all the snow from the driveway, and on the side there's this big pile of snow, and then the plow truck comes by and piles it even higher. She wasn't expected to live past the first night. She was extremely premature. It's not the same as a snow angel spreading their wings. Instead, you go in and you dig. I remember going to the hospital with my husband to visit her in her incubator, and the days were extremely cold and sunny. You reach your hands in with your mittens, your little tiny mittens. You take snow and you throw it out, not in the street and not in the driveway, but on top and you dig, and you throw it on top. When I think of my father, I always think of winter, and him shoveling the snow in the driveway with a cigarette dangling out of his mouth. And you dig in until it feels like you've got a nice nook that's big enough for the two of you, so you can sit. He had a heart condition, and he should not have been shoveling snow. He had to take nitroglycerin tablets for his angina, and nitroglycerin is the stuff of bombs. And you sit with your best friend, and you talk stories, and you dream of what you're going to do when you get to be a big adult. You try to dream big. What do I want to do when I grow up? My father always dreamed big. He always had big plans. He always had a way, a plan in the back of his mind for improving his life and the life of his family. He had a heart condition. In our safe little igloo, there were just the secrets we told. There was no mother yelling at me to make her coffee, or father abusing my best friend. Two more of my children were born in the dead of winter, in the middle of January, one day apart. It wasn't spreading our wings like angels in the snow and leaving our mark but it was our little piece of heaven. Snow seems like such a theme in my life as I was growing up, and not just the clean, white, sparkling stuff, but the dirty snow toward the end of winter, too. Until it happened, having a great laugh, and suddenly feet stomping on our head from our brothers tromping on top of our snow, equally breaking into our secret my father's stroke happened in the middle of the winter. He went into the soldier's home in Holyoke, and he never came out. They never got punished, but we still had our snow angels. We could go lay on our backs and spread our wings and look at the beautiful angel wings we left behind. So birth and death always happened in winter for me, almost always. Beth is from Savannah, Georgia, which takes me by surprise. Um, she is not taking any of this seriously, and neither should you. Please welcome <laughs> with me to the stage, Beth from Savannah. So I, um, I, I never understood what it would take to own my own home. So in uh, October 2014, it was the first time I've ever bought a house. And I left uh, East Hampton, where I'd been living for about three years, and moved to Williamsburg, really much in the woods. Um, well, before this, you know what it's like in an apartment. Uh, they're kind of in service to oneself, to your own dark moods, your own whims and wants. Uh, you don't have to worry about the busted pipes the snow accumulating on the house, um, the mice in the basement. So um, one of the first things I had to do as a homeowner was understand that when I ask a New Englander what I need to do, you know, for example, the well is no longer pumping water up into the house, what do I do? The answer is inevitably, you can do whatever you want to do. So you have to ask it this way, what would you do? And then you understand what needs to happen. But one of the things that I was too embarrassed to ask anybody about was um, stacking wood. I had a, the way that I'm heating my house is through a wood stove. And so I did what 
we do in this age is turned on YouTube. So I begin to understand that the measure of a man is his wood pile. <laughs> this caused me to wonder what is the measure of a woman, especially if you're on her own. But I found that um, it came to me easily. I understood the wobble, the rock. I understood that the bark goes up and the, the tender wood down to uh, allow rainwater to, to wash off. I understood that the measure of a chord is an L track of um, four by eight. And so I worked through an entire day stacking my, um, what turned out to be a little bit more than a chord. Now, I built my very first fire inside my home, and this was a moment of incredible pride and incredible warmth. There's a sense of incredible self-sufficiency and independence when it comes to the upkeep of a house, which I soon learned is almost like a plea. Let me stay here. Please let me stay. Um, very soon, I realized that human beings and squirrels are at war over birdseed. I had uh, a, uh, about three different bird seed hangers, or bird feeders outside. I really love watching the birds. And there's such an incredible variety in Western Mass, a, a variety I've never seen before. Um, but I found myself stomping outside in all manner of dress or undress to try and get the squirrels off the bird feeders, and they got used to me, and they would sort of signal each other, here she comes again, guys. <laughs> and um, as soon as I got to a certain distance back away, they would come out. But um, at one, there was one morning, and I had, I had lit this, this incredible fire. Um, all was quiet. It was uh, thick with snow. Um, my hands worked. My body worked. I had, um, you know, gotten rid of the, uh, I'd been able to dig out a path. I um, understood that I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I began to understand my body in the context of, of what must be done. But the squirrels were really bugging me. But this one morning, I um, was enjoying the warmth. First cup of coffee, I saw, saw the squirrels descending on the bird feeders. And I had this impromptu sort of, I'm going to you know, go out and get those squirrels. And I suddenly sat back down because I understood finally that hunger is what makes us. Mm -hmm. Hunger is who we are. And ever since then, I've been able to live with the squirrels. <laughs> John Williamson has been invaluable today, moving inanimate objects around. Um, so, and I'm going to ask him to, to move the chairs off the stage area for the, um, for the interns because this is the measure of man. This, this is the measure of our one man um, who I think deserves an extra round of applause just for showing up. There really does seem to be a gender imbalance whenever you offer a workshop that, um, that the participants tend to, it's, you know, I used to only teach women, actually, um, when I lived in Nantucket. I only taught women um, writing. And then I, it dawned on me gradually throughout the years that for some reason, and I don't know why this is, um, men seem to not be inclined to show up to do creative things. And I think it's great <laughs> that we had at least one representative from this gender. Um, <laughs> come today with the rest of us, um, and his name is John Williamson. He is a resident of Northampton. He is self-employed and has his own real estate company called Williamson um, Commercial Properties. He's going to tell a story with the title, Love, uh, sorry, oh my god, that was a Freudian slip. <laughs> it's okay. Well, it's yeah. February, so recently we have Valentine's Day, and I have love in my mind. <laughs> um, luck. <laughs> He's going to talk about luck. I'm thinking about love, but John Williamson is going to tell a story called Luck Conquers All, and it's the luckiest thing that ever happened to him. 
I've had a lot of lucky things happen to me in my life. It's hard to really rate what is the luckiest, but this is a pretty uh, lucky experience that I had. Um, in 1970, I found myself uh, relocating from Baltimore, Maryland to Truro, Massachusetts, which is out on the Cape, as you probably know. And um, it was winter, uh, what I would call in those days, uh, high ghost town season. Not many people around. And I was living with a, a group of people my age in an old farmhouse uh, in Truro. I dropped out of college, and uh, I had some friends who were artists in Baltimore who said, we're going to go live in Provincetown for the summer. Would you like to come? I said, sure. I had no idea where Provincetown was or what it was. I actually thought uh, I might be going to Providence, Rhode Island. <laughs> so uh, I was living with, the, with all these people in this farmhouse. And um, one day I went to general delivery to check my mail. And there was a letter. And the letter started greetings from the President of the United States. So uh, I had uh, been pretty successful at eluding the reality of the draft in the Vietnam War. But uh, I was being, uh, I was notified that I was to go to Boston and take my physical at the Boston Navy Yard. So uh, on the appointed day, I uh, drove to Hyannis. I got on a bus, a yellow school bus with probably 20 other guys. And uh, we were all taken to, to Boston for our uh, physical. Now, when we got there, um, when we got off the bus, there was somebody standing there who handed us our draft files from our draft boards. And my draft board was in. Uh, Towson, Maryland, which is a suburb of Baltimore. And uh, they divided us into two groups. One group was going to take the written test first, and the other group was going to take the actual physical. So I was in the group that, that was to take the written test first. And so I had my file, I went in, it was a classroom setting, and I thought, well, this will be easy. I'll just, I'll just answer the questions incorrectly, and I'll be fine. <laughs> and of course, the instructor said, uh, you can't fail this test. <laughs> said, uh, you're going to take this test as many times as you have to until you pass it. <laughs> so I thought, well, there goes that opportunity. <laughs> now, I had, I had you know, talked to some people who had told me, oh, you can be a conscientious objector. And I, and I didn't really know much about being a conscientious objector. And I, there were certain obvious uh, requirements. Uh, so I wasn't very con I wasn't very conscientious about being uh, the uh, objective. So that uh, that means of um, of getting out of failing failing the physical didn't work. Uh, so I sat down at my desk and I looked through my file. I'd never seen it before, and there was a letter from a doctor in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and it said regarding my patient John Williamson. John's been a patient of mine for several years. He has a chronic uh, 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 condition called hyperelasticity, which uh, is a joint disorder. And as an example, he can dislocate his shoulder by rolling over in his sleep. <laughs> and you know, I heard the theme song from the Twilight Zone in my mind <laughs> when I saw this letter. And where did it come from? I've never been to Ann Arbor, Michigan. I don't have hyperelasticity. He said he'd operated on me several times. I didn't have any scars. I could not, for the life of me, figure out what was going on. But I figured I'd just run with it. So I passed the written test, in case you were worried, and um, went to the physical, the actual physical. And I'm in line with all these guys. And, they're all talking about how they really want to really want to pass the physical, and I'm thinking to myself, God, I, I really want to fail this physical. But there was no way I was going to fail because I was in perfect condition, young and, and healthy. So um, we went through the whole bank of tests, you know, the hearing test and, and the eye test, and tried to pretend like I was deaf. They didn't believe me. 
tried to pretend I was blind, it didn't believe me either. <laughs> Finally got to the first actual physician that I had seen going through these, this battery of tests. And the physician opens my file, he looks at the letter, and he says, I've got bad news for you. I said, what's that? He said, you're not fit for military service. And uh, he literally took a rubber stamp and stamped the file 4F permanent deferment. And he said, go back and get on the bus. So I went out, and I was, out of all of the guys that were on the bus, I was the first one back on the bus. And I was, my head was swimming. I couldn't figure out what was going on. And the whole way back on the bus, I'm trying to think, how did this happen? There's got to be a logical explanation. And then all of a sudden, it hit me. In 1966, when I was a senior in high school, I went to the local tuxedo rental place to get my tux for the prom. And I got home, and I put it on, and it was way too big. And I was late, and you know how it goes. So I, I went back to the tuxedo rental place. I walked in, I said, I've got this tux. It's got my name on it, but it doesn't fit me. And there's another fellow standing there. And he said, I've got this tux. It's got my name on it, and it doesn't fit me. <laughs> so I met the other John Williamson. <laughs> Now what I deduced from this experience, this, this, this opened the door to, to the, whole, the whole situation, is I, we went to separate high schools. I went to Delaney, he went to Towson. We never knew each other. We had the same name. But there was one thing that we did share in common, and that was the draft board. So what I, uh, I have deduced that what happened was it was a clerical error. The letter was sent from the physician. Whether the other John Williamson really had hyperelasticity or not, didn't matter. The letter was put in my file, and that was the way that I got the permanent deferment. Now, I had some guilt about it. Yeah. This is many years later. <laughs> so I went to the virtual Vietnam War Memorial, and guess what? I didn't find my name. And so the guilt was assuaged, and everything ended up being just the way I hoped that it would. So I'm bringing up the rear. Um, that was really magnificent. I, of course, I'm biased. <laughs> Um, but I thought that was a magnificent collection of stories. Um, and uh, I'm just going to close with the blizzard of 78. If you were in the blizzard of 78 in Massachusetts, raise your hand. <coughs> really? All right. Okay. Oh, it's just, all right. Blizzard of 78. Okay. So um, I was in divinity school in during the blizzard of 78. Uh, technically a student at Harvard Divinity and living at the Episcopal Seminary, which is in Harvard Square. It was the first time, the blizzard of 78, I have, I'm really bad at numbers, walls of snow. Just walls of snow. And the only way that you could get anywhere was if you had skis and ski poles. So that's just the way it was. Just I'd never seen so much snow in my life. It was a snow copolypse. And that was and if you look at photographs, and there is a book, a collection of photographs of the Blizzard of 78, you can see cars on the Mass Pike and everything. And there were just, I don't know, thousands of people I think got stranded during the Blizzard of 78. It hit fast, it hit hard. Harvard University itself, I believe, was founded in the 1600s. It's, I don't know if anybody can back it. It was the 1600s, um, back in the 17th, uh, 17th century. They had never in, I don't know how many hundreds of years that was, because I'm bad at numbers, but OK, 1600s to 1978, they had never closed Harvard, canceled classes due to snow. They did 
for the blizzard of 78. And I'm trying to remember like the month it was. I'm, I'm thinking January. of January. January? So, but it was the start of the term. So it was the end, it must have been the end of January, right? Oh, but that would be like the, there, okay, so classes started earlier back then. You really got your money's worth. It was less money, but you had more classes. So it was the first week of classes, and they canceled classes. We were stuck at the seminary, which is a self-enclosed kind of, it's called a close, you know, so everybody lives there, the faculty and the students. Um, it's, it's a drag, I think, being in a blizzard on your own. Um, luckily, I had a boyfriend, and there, were, there was a set of us, I think four sets of couples. And um, so I didn't really go to Divinity School to become a minister, I went to marry a minister. So that was sort of my reaction <laughs> to having gone to a school where um, Sarah Lawrence, where everybody uh, was a feminist, and um, so I was, you know, reading Ms. Magazine and being a really good feminist. But then I decided that I really like to marry a minister, so um, it just seemed like a decent profession for a husband. And so I had this boyfriend, and um, I'll just I'll call him Luke because that was his name. I tended to attract men with names of the Gospels at that time. So there was Matthew, there was Mark, there was John, and this, I had Luke. <laughs> For the blizzard, <laughs> he was my blizzard boyfriend. And the group of us got together and uh, decided to play a game called Dictionary, appropriately enough to elaborate. Some of you know what this is, I'll tell you what this is. You take um, a dictionary and somebody opens the dictionary and reads a word. And if anybody knows the definition of the word, you can't use that word. You have to get consensus that nobody knows the definition of the word. So we were playing this game, dictionary. And what happens is everybody writes a fake definition of the word. And one person who is the, I forget what they're called, but they're the person who finds it, the <coughs> scorekeeper, they write the real definition of the word. And they all get mixed up, and then each one is read. So that if you vote for the real definition of the word, you win a lot of points. If you vote for somebody else's fake definition, they win points from you and you lose points, all right? So what do you do during a blizzard but something like this? And so there's four couples and um, Two of the couples, both of them were trained to be ministers. It was very early in the time when women were not getting ordained as Episcopal priests. So it was kind of a very edgy, revolutionary time. But two of them were couples and the women were becoming priests. All four men were on the ordination track, as they say. And I was one of the girlfriends getting a degree in theology from Harvard. Um, and we were going through this round of words and a word came up that nobody knew. And it was, a, it was an adjective. And, um, well, it was said as a noun, but it was also, you could use it in the adjectival form if you wanted to define it. So I'm going to give you the noun, which, and the word was uh, mictorician. And, oh, really? Okay, so, okay. Um, if you know the definition of this word, don't call it out. Let's not call it out. Um, none of us knew the definition of this word. I think some of you do. But, um, so the noun form was micturition and the adjectival form, micturitic. Micturitic, excuse me. Micturitic, okay. So you could define it as either or. <clears throat> and I was one of the people writing a fake definition. And, um, I can tell you that one of them had to do with Paul Revere's ride, that, <laughs> that when Paul Revere, well you know, you're living in Cambridge, you know, you think historically, so when Paul Revere was warning that the British were coming, um, this was viewed by the one person who read the definition as an act of micturish. <laughs> like, well, I don't like, know what it means. But, it was defined as an act of maturition. Yeah. 
that Paul Revere was warning that the Redcoats were coming. <clears throat> All right. Um, another definition took the adjectival form, micturitic, and was describing the intricate designs on Sherpa snowshoes. Um, Sherpas are the men who lead you up in Nepal. <coughs> What's the big mountain? The Himalayas, right? So the Sherpas, yeah, they're actually the guides who lead you up the mountain. And so Mictoritic was just defined as the design on their, on Sherpa snowshoes. And um, uniformly, every single person in there who was playing in this round, and there were seven of us, we all voted for the design on the Sherpa snowshoes. It really sounded very viable and everything else sounded incredibly wacky. Like one of the definitions was something like somebody who has to urinate like so frequently that you can't even count. Like it's not just like, I don't know how many people, I don't know how often people pee, but I mean, I've never really thought about it. It could be, I don't know, 10 times a day or I don't know, depending on if you drink beer in the evening, how would you know? So that seemed obviously to, you know, somebody made that. So we all voted for the Sherpa snowshoes. <clears throat> and then the person running the round announced what the definition was. And the definition was, in fact, um, frequent peer. Um, and my boyfriend, uh, who was uh, becoming ordained as an Episcopal priest, fell out of his chair laughing so hard um, that um, everybody there wanted to know what was so funny about that. I mean, we all lost the round. Why was he laughing? And in the midst of his gales of hysterical laughter, he announced to everybody in the room that it was extremely funny that I had gotten it wrong because um, I get up every hour all night long to pee. And he announced this so that um, we ended at that round. Um, and um, seminaries are, you know, everybody lives together and eats together. It took less than 24 hours for everyone at the seminary to find out how often Sally Greenhouse pees. And there, became an entire generation nationally of Episcopal priests who are all too aware that I am a frequent peer. Um, so I don't go to any Episcopal churches <laughs> where any priest serving at that church could have been either friends with anyone there during the blizzard of 78, or who was in fact in that room when we were playing the game during the blizzard of 78. Happily for me, they are heading toward retirement. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you.